Welcome, pro wrestling fans, to another edition of Raw Recap. I'm your host of AW Mania, JP. Um, this is the audio version for the Raw Recap. We'll be back to our regularly scheduled video version of AEW Dynamite, SmackDown, and the future Raw Recaps, um, as I normally do. But for the time being, it's just going to be the audio version for today's Raw. So let's jump right into it. What happened last night on Monday Night Raw, the March 23rd edition of Monday Night Raw, as the road to WrestleMania continued? Well, let's just break down on what happened in terms of the ratings-wise. Yesterday, turns out, it was the lowest-rated Monday Night Raw of 2020 so far. Uh, It averaged a 2.000... No, 2.006 million viewers. So in total, it averaged about 2 million viewers for the entire three hours. From hour 1, 8 to 9 p.m., 2.2, we'll say 2.3 million viewers. From hour 9, 2.004 million viewers. And hour 10, averaging its lowest rated, lowest rating of 2020 and maybe of all time for Raw, at 1.7 million viewers viewers now i'm not going to go into guessing as to why um the ratings were so low for yesterday everything that's going on in the world people probably had more important things to worry about than watching monday night raw from an empty arena but listen the week before they had a 2.3 million viewers uh, average uh their highest to date was february 17th which averaged 2.4 million viewers Look, they were they were shy of 400,000 viewers, uh, from what we can tell, this week. Um, maybe next week, things turn around. Uh, it's very rare. Look, we're heading into WrestleMania season, and you had uh, Brock Lesnar, uh, Randy Orton, and uh, Shayna Baszler announced to be on the card here tonight. So you had three major names, two major names, and one future star of the business announced to be appearing on your Monday Night Raw show. Apart from that, there were no matches that were announced for t- for yesterday's event, so you didn't really know what you were going to be getting until you turned on Monday Night Raw. Uh, that could be a possibility as to why it didn't help. You know, people got a, a glimpse of what Monday Night Raw is going to be like for the foreseeable future until the coronavirus. Um, I, I don't want to say goes away or the situation is handled, and maybe they weren't a fan of what they saw uh, the week before and what they saw also with SmackDown. It becomes tough to watch when you're watching a pro wrestling show that is just showing re- re- repeats or recaps or replays of previous events of the past. And unless you haven't seen it, you're most likely not going to be sticking around to watch said match. Which which is kind of funny because the highest rating did come from the opening first hour, which did feature a replay. And the lowest rating actually came from the third hour, which featured another replay of the WrestleMania 34 replay if i'm if i'm correct i think it was wrestlemania 34 where it featured oscar taking on charlotte flair uh, for the women's championship and that had surprisingly the lowest yep yeah, wrestlemania 34 2018 that had the lowest rating segment which is very weird because that was actually one of the better matches at wrestlemania 34 these two women uh competed uh, and what was a hot match, uh, it was promoted as uh, the undefeated former NXT Women's Champion. She never lost her title. She gave it up uh, to come up to the Raw roster, to come up to the WWE roster. She went on to win the Royal Rumble and was going to be challenging the unbeatable, simply unbeatable Charlotte Flair. Um, legendary Charlotte Flair, who continues to make a name for herself even today. And it was a big match. It was a big time match with a big time feel. And this is where uh, Asuka suffered her first loss at the hands of Charlotte Flair. And what many were surprised to see and what many um, to this day still feel like she's never really bounced back from that, from losing to Charlotte. She's still been trying to find her groove. Yes, she's managed to win the Women's Championship, but her reign wasn't for that long. Yes, she's currently the Raw or the the Tag Team Champion uh, with uh, Carrie Zane. But when was the last time they defended those titles? When was the last time we've actually took them seriously as a threat? So maybe she hasn't. Look, uh, from a fan's perspective, I don't feel she has 
um, ever recovered from that loss to Charlotte Flair, which is not Charlotte Flair's fault. It's just a question of the company not, I guess, fully being behind her or not pushing her the way Triple H pushed her on, on NXT. But apart from that match, uh, Raw kicked off with obviously a, a talking segment. You're not going to kick off Raw immediately with a match. Raw kicks off with a recap of what's been going on over the last couple of weeks. Um, Paul Heyman, Paul, the, the, the video package that we saw the week before with Paul Heyman, Brock Lesnar, and Drew McIntyre all hyping up the WrestleMania matchup that they're going to have. Uh, camera cuts to Paul Heyman standing in the middle of the ring with Brock Lesnar by his side. Um, look, they did something interesting to me to be. I know yesterday I complained about them constantly facing the camera towards the the fans, uh, the lack of fans, or continuing to put the hard cam on the bleachers and the seats where there's no one sitting. Yesterday they decided to take a new approach, and that's having the camera face the entrance ramp. And I found that made all the difference. Uh, it added something to the show. It added something that was missing. It, it wasn't despairing to watch. It wasn't depressing to watch. It added what needed to be added from the very beginning. And that's, look, we're not looking at nobody. We're looking at an entranceway. And I'd rather look at an entranceway than look at nothing. So Paul does a little shtick. Uh... Breaks down how Brock isn't afraid of Drew McIntyre. Yes, you got the best of him at rest at the Royal Rumble, but when Brock gets his hands on you, you're gonna beg to God for uh, for for help. But all you're gonna get is a busy signal, and the only prayer that you're gonna hear is the fact that Lesnar is gonna make it quick and painless. But Lesnar will make it quick, but he can't promise he'll make it painless. He informs McIntyre that. He's a made man because the fight that he brought to Lesnar. But when WrestleMania is over, McIntyre won't be the champion. Heyman then goes on to use the saying, Then, now, and forever, Brock Lesnar will be your reigning, defending, undisputed WWE World Champion. Heyman cuts his usual shtick of a promo, but... Instead of guaranteeing a victory, which he doesn't, if you've noticed, he hasn't yet to guarantee a victory so far over Drew McIntyre. So maybe take that for a, for a grain of salt, right? Normally, he goes out and he says, spoiler alert, Brock will win. In this case, he's yet to make a, a spoiler prediction whether or not Brock is going to win. Following the promo by Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar, we decided to take a trip down memory lane and recapping what happened the week before with AJ Styles, uh, Gallows, Carl Anderson, and The Undertaker, with The Undertaker getting the better of Gallows and Anderson last week. Uh, Saxton goes on to say that AJ Styles is going to appear live on tonight's show to address The Undertaker. Following that, Phillips, he, he sets up a Royal Rumble match a replay from 2015, where Brock Lesnar defended his world championship against John Cena and Seth Rollins in what many people consider one of the best triple threat matches that WWE has produced in the last Five to ten years, I'll say. Uh, personally, I'll say in the last five years, one of the best triple threat matches that WWE has ever put together. Throughout the show, they continue to recap the same old story. Uh, what Undertaker did to Gallows and Anderson, finally setting up AJ Styles to come out to the ring. Um, look, this has been an interesting... Um, this has been an interesting build for The Undertaker and AJ Styles uh, with the fact that they're now um, not going to be competing in a, in a big building. They're not going to be competing uh, on a WrestleMania stage. They're going to be competing in the Performance Center and not even the Performance Center. AJ Styles goes on to announce that he's going to put The Undertaker down, the same old shtick that he's the old man and this is Michelle McCool's fault. And by the end of this, he's going to have Undertaker wearing diapers uh, and he's going to be the gothic version of Tiger King when it's all said and done. He then makes the announcement that he's going to take take her back to where he belongs when he competes against him in a boneyard match. Uh, he says that's the perfect plot picked out to bury Undertaker. He said it's the same plot that Michelle picked out when she buried Undertaker's career. I don't know what a boneyard match is. I'm going to assume it's a buried alive match that's going to take place in, I guess, a graveyard. Uh, again, we'll, well, maybe we'll find out next week or... They'll just save it for WrestleMania to keep the surprise. That just goes to show you that this is going to be a matchup that's going to be recorded 
at a different location and not just the WWE Performance Center or Full Sail Arena like the rest of WrestleMania uh, will most likely be recorded in. It's a strange match. Uh, I don't know what a Boneyard match is. No one seems to know what a Boneyard, boneyard match is. Um, for at this point, it, it just may very well be a buried alive match taking place in a graveyard. We'll find out. For those unaware, uh, it was announced that at WrestleMania, it's going to be the Street Profits taking on Angel Garza and Andrade. The reason for this is due to the fact that uh, Umberto, Umberto Del Rio suffered a injury and he's going to be missing WrestleMania. And Rey Mysterio is at home um, under quarantine. Under quarantine. We're unsure what it is. So before we start jumping to conclusions, Rey is at home. Uh, dealing with uh, sickness. Hopefully we get an update in the near future of what's going on. Charlie Caruso interviews Andrade and Garza and Selena Vega. Selena says that the Street Profits could dance around with the Red Cups. They could continue dancing all they want. But at the end of the day at WrestleMania, Angel, Angel Garza and Andrade are going to walk out holding those tag team titles. Andrade and Garza speak briefly. They, have, they give a little promo. Um, that's about it. Not, nothing really too much to say besides they're going to beat the Street Profits. Uh, from then we go to our tag team match, our first match of the night, which take, took place at the top of the hour, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time. It was Angel Garza and Andrade taking on Ricochet and Cedric Alexander. A very interesting match uh, put together. Uh, Angel Garza and Andrade, this is the first time they're going to be teaming together before they take on the tag team champions at WrestleMania. And Ricochet and Cedric Alexander have basically been in the same boat uh treated as jobbers and have lost their last couple of matches on raw um besides ricochet picking up the victory on wwe main event uh two weeks ago um i, I you know what coming from this match i wouldn't mind seeing more ricochet and cedric alexander as a team i think they would make an interesting tag team um uh, for the division the division that's currently missing um, who, uh, who they miss? They're missing the AOP. Um, Rezar is suffering from an injury, therefore he's gonna be out. Um, that's why they're not in this tag team match. And apart from really the Viking Raiders and uh, Gallows and Anderson, the tag team division is pretty much slim, slim pickings for the WWE. So to have Andrade and and, and Garza. They make an interesting team, and at the same time, if we can form something with Cedric Alexander and Ricochet, two of the highest flying guys in the, uh, on the roster, two of the most athletic guys on the roster, and at the same time, two of the uh, most entertaining in the ring uh, in terms of what they could do and the style of match that they could bring, uh, I think that them as a tag team would probably be better than them as singles competitors and being squandered, their talents being squandered as they have been over the last few weeks. So we'll see if they remain as a tag team. Uh, apart from that, they took the loss tonight, which was expected. Uh, Angel Garza and Andrade needed the victory to lead into their WrestleMania tag team title match. Uh, the match was pretty long. It, it went close to 20 minutes. We'll see. It was around roughly 18 minutes and up. And it was a very good competitive back and forth match. Um, it didn't really set up as to why Garza and Andrade deserve a, a tag team title shot. I just assumed that Vince wanted something... Uh, Something original, something fresh as the WrestleMania tag team title match for for WrestleMania instead of having the same old match over and over again. What you may have noticed during this matchup was that Saxton and Phillips were joined on commentary by the Street Profits. I assume they were joined on commentary because uh, just to add something to this match. This was your first opening match on the, the Raw event. Um, rather than having it in complete silence and the commentators just doing their commentary work, they added these two because... Uh, the Street Profits are known for making some noise. Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford are known for being the loudmouths of, of the WWE Raw roster, giving their voice and their opinions, cheering, screaming, and, and having a good time. And that's pretty much what they were needed for and why they were on commentary, to add a little bit more, to add like the feeling like you're in an arena with an audience there, to add more to the live show. And it really did add something. It added something interesting. It added a different perspective than just... Uh, hearing the guys take bumps in the ring and the commentators calling it. From there, uh, the Street Prophet stood on the commentary table, staring off at Angel Garza and Andrada, taunting them. Eventually, they made their way to the ring, um, ended up in a brawl, a brief brawl. Um, the Street Prophets get the better of Angel Garza, Angel Garza and Andrada. Andrade, they, they, 
they scatter off, leaving the Street Profits in the ring where they're going to have themselves a tag team match. Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins take on Shane Thorne and Brendan Vink in a non-title match. Doesn't really matter, the Street Profits win, but it's nice to see Shane Thorne is still on the, uh, the WWE roster. Following that, we get some highlights where you see R-Truth pitting Riddick Moss to regain the WWE 24-7 championship. Yay. From there, we moved on to Phillips hyping up an interview with Shayna Baszler after the commercial break. They come back. Charlie Caruso sitting in the ring. Uh, she's conducting a sit-down interview with Bray Baszler. I guess she asked some of the basic questions. Um, how do you intend to conduct yourself as a champion? Baszler doesn't reply. <laughs> Caruso asks her, "How do you feel? Um, how do you feel about going into your first WrestleMania match?" Baszler makes a joke. "Hey, you look nervous. Are you afraid I'm gonna bite?" "Ha ha ha! Sorry, I couldn't help myself." Stupid line. Caruso asks if the biting is type of the brutality that Becky Lynch should expect at WrestleMania. Baszler makes it clear. Uh, Becky Lynch should expect to lose. Becky Lynch should expect to be destroyed. Uh, the reason why Baszler has come to Raw, the reason why Baszler is challenging Becky Lynch is because she wants to make her life a living hell. She loves destroying people, and there's nothing better than destroying your world champion and taking the title from her. That will destroy Becky Lynch. And because this interview segment was taking place in the dark, we never saw um, Becky Lynch sneak up behind Shayna Baszler and hit her from the behind with a steel chair. Lights obviously turn on, revealing Becky Lynch standing behind uh, Shayna Baszler, where she then once again hits Baszler with the chair. Baszler lies on the ground in, in agony, holding her head, holding her back in pain and disbelief that she got caught off guard by Becky Lynch. Becky stares down at Shayna Baszler, smiling. She's happy with the damage she's caused, and she's happy with what is going to come uh, what, what she's done so far, this is her little measure of revenge on what Shayna Baszler's been doing to her over the last few weeks, from the bite to the back of the neck, to the threats that she's made towards her. The road to WrestleMania continues, and Baszler and Becky Lynch seem to be uh, your main event for one of the two nights, whether it be Saturday night or Sunday night. That's the direction it seems that the WWE is taking in. At this point, it makes the most sense. Uh, it has the most bang for your buck. It's got the most intense intensity between I would say the three women title matches at this point uh for sure over the Bailey match but between Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch and Shayna Baszler uh look the obvious choice would be Charlotte Flair because she won the Rumble and the Royal Rumble winner should always main event a Wrestlemania but if you're gonna go in terms of uh, fan and star power and name value, I guess Becky Lynch and Shayna Baszler is the way to go, just simply because Baszler has uh, a name value due to the fact that she's a former cage fighter, UFC fighter, mixed martial arts fighter, so she brings in that authenticity that is missing from Rhea Ripley. Uh, following that segment, do you get yourself a one-minute who-gives-a-shit match between Alex Ther Black and uh, Leon Ruff? Whatever. Black kicks him in the face. Uh, we get the announcement that Aleister Black's going to be competing at WrestleMania against Bobby Lashley for absolutely no reason except the fact that Bobby Lashley wants to test himself against uh, the baddest man on the roster and Aleister Black likes to, likes to fight. Likes to fight. That's it. We came back to Seth Rollins, who's supposed to appear on Monday Night Raw. Kevin Owens stands in the ring after the break. He says for the last week he's offered a challenge to Rollins, but um, hasn't hasn't heard anything. Rollins has nowhere been nowhere to be found. Where, where's he been hiding? He heard that Rollins is in the building, so he figured he would come out and be all ears so he could get Rollins' response face-to-face. -face. Uh, out comes Rollins. He makes his entrance. Rollins makes a quick little joke about how this place looks nice, and he adds that he was struggling to wrap his head around why Owens assumed that he would have an advantage at by facing him in the performance center. Rollins said he didn't train at the PC, but he recalled Owens saying he created memories while training here. Rollins said he didn't, said the PC didn't exist when he was training. Rollins said it was built on his sacrifice and his success, and if it wasn't for what he did at FCW, 
this dilapidated warehouse would not be in existence. So you should be thanking me for my hard work. His whole life, he's had to work his way up. All right, he had to start from the bottom to get to where he is. He didn't have a beautiful facility the way Owens had a chance to train to succeed. He had to work his butt off from the bottom until he finally got an opportunity to beat Brock Lesnar and to win the WWE Championship. He didn't get the championship handed to him the way Raw, the way Kevin Owens did. Um, he made it clear that he questions why Owens picked the WrestleMania as why as a place to make an example out of him. And he went on to say that Rollins has won the Intercontinental Championship, the Universal title. He beat Brock Lesnar. He beat Triple H. He cashed in the money in the bank. He's had one of the most successful runs in WrestleMania history. And he's made it clear that this WrestleMania, he's going to make one more WrestleMania moment. And that's when he defeats Kevin Owens in the very center he calls his home as a starting ground. He makes it clear that you can't beat me on my worst day. And at WrestleMania, and, Re and WrestleMania is never my worst day because under pressure, I become God. You really don't stand a chance. Music hits, and that's, that's that. That's the promo that Seth Rollins cuts on Kevin Owens. Very religious, uh, making it clear that he considers himself God and how no one stands a chance against him at WrestleMania. And WrestleMania is his home, basically like the way The Undertaker used to consider uh, WrestleMania his home. It's a simple promo. I'm very excited by this match. I think Rollins and Owens have been putting uh, the effort and have been putting in the work building this feud. And it's unfortunate that they're going to be competing in the PC Center. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping for, some, for a great, great match from these two guys. So to continue the promotion behind Charlotte Flair and... Rhea Ripley, we cut ourselves to Charlotte Flair versus Oscar at WrestleMania 34 to continue to prove why Charlotte Flair is one of the baddest women on the planet. Look, we know how that WrestleMania 34 match went. If you don't, well, it's uh, simple. Charlotte Flair wins uh, with a figure eight, beating Oscar, uh, giving her her first loss. Uh, from there, we went to our final segment of the night where Randy Orton was going to be addressing Edge's challenge to a last man standing match orton comes out they replay all the acts of brutality that orton did to edge and his wife weeks ago orton with a mic in hand says he needs to apologize three weeks ago i lied to your wife when i said that you were a junkie for the roar of the crowd or orton makes it clear that edge you're actually a junkie for your own ego adam copeland is a junkie for Edge. Adam Copeland doesn't need a crowd. Adam Copeland had in himself a guaranteed Hall of Fame career. Um, Orton said he won a title. Orton says he won the Intercontinental title a year after he was called up. And then less than a year, he became the youngest world champion in history. Orton said Mick Foley didn't pass him the torch. He threw him a pile of thumbtacks so he spat in his face and beat him and took the torch. Orton went on to say that he's went from being a third generation prospect to being one of the three most deadliest letters in sports entertainment. Nothing was handed to him. He had to work for it all. He had to start from the bottom. He had to start from being the guy that people disliked as being the guy that Triple H single-handedly handpicked to be a part of Evolution. Orton said that from day one, he had to prove himself in the locker room. And nobody had as much grit as he did. Nobody, including Edge. He recalled Edge calling him an entitled brat. Orton laughed and then noted that Edge... <coughs> calling him an entitled brat. He goes on to say, Edge, if you were offered an opportunity in Evolution instead of me, you would have most likely taken that without hesitation. But now, Edge, you want to face me at WrestleMania in a last man standing match? Edge, you may be writing this story. But at WrestleMania, I'm going to write the last chapter of our story. And he accepts. So WrestleMania, you've got it. It's official. It's a last man standing match between Edge and Randy Orton. Look, the promos were top-notch tonight. Randy Orton gave a top-notch promo. Randy Orton nailed it out of the park. Uh, the feud between him and Edge continues to feel real. Real. It continues to feel authentic. Same thing as real. 
and it's unfortunate that this match is going to be taking place at the performance center but i don't look i don't expect anything different than what they would have delivered if they were in front of a live audience the promo from Seth Rollins and Kevin Owens, both guys, continue to deliver grade A promos. Same thing as Orton. It's an unfortunate. It's not going to be in front of a live audience, but I expect these two to bring their A game. Paul Heyman always cuts amazing promos. Promos were on point tonight. Um, the only real match that occurred was the tag team match between Andrade and Garza taking on... I even forgot who it was. That's how unimportant it was. Taking on Cedric Alexander and... Ricochet. That was your only real match of the night. Uh, those two guys, look, they worked their butts off, and and it was a good match. Uh, for, for your only real match of the night, it was a good match. The only weird thing was the AJ Styles promo segment. Uh, they've had a weird build since being put in the Performance Center. AJ and Undertaker have just been having a weird, weird build towards their WrestleMania match, and it's truly unfortunate. It should have been something special. It should have been something bigger than what it is, especially for these two uh, Goliath athletes, these two future Hall of Famers. But it is what it is, and we've got to deal with the situation that we've been dealt with. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for joining me for this week's Raw recap. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope I was able to cover as much as what occurred on Raw without being too, uh, too opinionated on what the show we had i'm doing my best to cut back on especially with with the situation on hand in the performance center i'm just giving you the rundown of what occurred on raw uh that's basically what this is meant to be it's meant to be a recap for those who don't want to watch it or those who just want to have like a quick um a quick retelling of what what they missed or what they didn't miss as always thank you for joining me for aw mania the raw recap i'll see you for um for aw dynamite I'm actually quite excited for that show. So I'll see you um I'll see you Thursday for my AEW Dynamite AEW Dynamite recap.